Friday, everybody, and thanks so much for joining me in today's episode of A Forgotten Horror Gem. I am Den, and you are watching Den of Horror. Now, today is a pretty special episode for me because it's the first episode in a series where I'm going to be taking a look at some horror movies, old and new, that I feel didn't quite get the love and respect that they deserved upon their release. Could be a lot of reasons for this, but anyway, I feel that these films deserve a second look. Maybe we need to put on a new pair of glasses and watch these films through a different lens. So, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you and sinking my teeth into this old Universal Studios horror classic. A horror movie classic that underperformed at the box office. A horror movie classic that underwhelmed fans and critics alike. A horror movie classic that wasn't that scary. A monstrous horror movie classic that was about as monstrous as a toothless baby marshmallow. A horror movie classic that wasn't Classic, after all. Wait a minute. That's not right. What the hell am I talking about? I mean, if it wasn't that great, then what the heck am I so excited about? It's so exciting because it was the first horror movie that I ever watched. Forgotten horror movie gem I am talking about is of course 1945's House of Dracula. Oh, 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 please, oh, just, oh, just, just put down the stakes and the torches and, and, and all the, the, the throwy things, please. Just, okay, I admit, I did say some nasty things about House of Dracula before and, and I'm probably going to say a few more nasty things. Oh, please, just hear me out. I, I do love this film. And I am going to share with you why I think House of Dracula is indeed a forgotten horror movie gem and, and why you should revisit or at least watch it if you haven't already. Okay? Please, just let's keep this calm. This is a, a family channel. Now, for those of you that don't know, House of Dracula was something like a, an Avengers or The Expendables, but of the horror movie genre, uniting into one film some of the genre's most famous, most beloved, and most classic monsters. That's right, the Frankenstein monster, Count Dracula, and my personal favorite, Larry Talbot, aka the Wolfman. The film centers around Count Dracula and Larry Talbot, both seeking out the services of an eccentric doctor in the hopes of finding a cure to their deadly and monstrous afflictions. Now, famous horror monsters aside, the film also boasted a phenomenal cast and crew. So why then was House of Dracula met with such a negative or at best lukewarm response? Because it just wasn't that good. <laughs> Hear me out. I, I, I know that you have a lot of questions. I know I'm not making a lot of sense with everything I'm saying and doing right now, but, but I promise you, in the end, it will all make sense. Okay, now, now, now before I get into why I felt that the film maybe wasn't as good as it could have or should have been, let me at least explain why House of Dracula was probably destined or at least cursed to fail from the very beginning, regardless of how good it was or wasn't. Well, for one, the film was shot and released in 1945. I mean, World War II had just ended. And I think that at least to some degree, people were more interested in trying to piece their lives back together rather than watching horror movies, or at least the kind of horror movie that dealt with gothic vampires and werewolves. Another thing is that the 1940s is often regarded by experts as being, creatively speaking, horror's worst ever decade. Now, I'm going to dive into this notion a little deeper in a future episode, but something very significant happened in the 1940s, and that is that a very strict motion picture act was passed that censored a lot of the films of that time. Now, if there's one thing that you and I both know horror simply does not like, it's being censored. So I think that House of Dracula was definitely negatively impacted by this very strict censorship act. Now, in stark contrast to the 1940s, the 1930s is often regarded as being the golden age of horror, and for very good reason. Audiences were seeing things that they, that they never believed possible in their wildest dreams. Scary monsters, jaw-dropping makeup effects, incredible scripts, and mega-famous movie stars like, like Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff had all ushered the genre of horror to the very top of the box office charts. But by the late 1930s and the early 40s, horror in its current form had started to grow stale and saturated. 
I mean, we had seen Frankenstein. We had seen the bride of Frankenstein. And then we saw Frankenstein's daughter. Frankenstein's great-great-granddaughter. Frankenstein's bolt. Frankenstein loses his bolt. Frankenstein loses his bolt and the Wolfman picks it up. Frankenstein loses his bolt and the Wolfman picks it up and then Dracula attacks the Wolfman. Blah, 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 blah. Crazy. <laughs> hey, audiences have different entertainment needs now. They wanted a fresher, newer type of horror film that reflected the changing times. And so, the universal monsters of old soon needed to give way to the creature features of the 1950s. Enter Godzilla and King Kong. That's right. The poor old Wolfman and his long array of toothless young pup sequels had to go. And speaking about mega famous horror movie stars, there seem to be a couple of noticeable absentees from the cast list of House of Dracula. Boris Kodlov, he had hung up his boots, or at least his bolts, and had vowed to never again play Frankenstein's monster. And also Bela Lugosi had vanished from the cast list as quick as a bat in the night, leaving blood-sucking duties to the equally as good but far less famous John Carradine. Now this left the very tall order of luring audiences into movie theatres up to the ever-brilliant Lon Chaney Jr., who would inevitably don the Wolfman's famous yak hair and claws for the very last time in this film. Okay, but all of that extra stuff aside, as a film based completely on its own merit, House of Dracula just doesn't quite pull it off for me. No, no, just, just, get, get me out, please, just one more moment, okay? I mean, listen, I can understand that Larry Talbot is seeking a cure for his lycanthropy. Lycanthropy, lycanthropy! Here we go again. Like Contropy. I can understand that Larry Talbot is seeking a cure for his lycanthropy. But why Dracula? Why is he looking for a cure? I mean, the film gives a reason, but the whole, oh, I'm feeling a little bit cursed, mm, feels a little bit flimsy to me. And, and talking about Dracula, why is this film called House of Dracula? It's not his house. Maybe you guys have an insight that I haven't thought of. Please let me know in the comments down below. Another thing that kind of gets me about House of Dracula is the inclusion of the Frankenstein monster. It feels a little bit plucked on. I mean, there are, again, some flimsy reasons, but it almost feels like, hey, let's throw Frankenstein into the film and, and, and that'll bring the audiences in. The thing that really kind of got me was the showdown between Frankenstein and Larry at the end. In fact, this is just an opinion thing, I would have liked to have seen the Wolfman actually return for one final showdown against the Frankenstein monster. Instead, and spoiler alert, the Frankenstein monster gets foiled by a fiery bookshelf. But wait, there must be something good about this film. I mean, that is why I've dedicated an entire episode to it. I mean, I'm not just going to criticize it, that, that would make no sense, okay? There is a lot to love about House of Dracula and like I said, I think that there's a very good reason as to why this should be rated as a forgotten horror movie gem. Now I really enjoyed John Carradine's portrayal of Count Dracula. Granted, Bela Lugosi is, was and probably always will be Dracula's most definitive portrayal, undoubtedly so. I mean, Carradine had some pretty big boots and fangs to fill, but I feel that he did so with a distinguished and charismatic style of his own. Where his portrayal might not be the most definitive one, it certainly is a worthy and, and unique one in its own way. Also Lon Chaney Jr., another definitive portrayal, but this time of the Wolfman. And even for the over-the-top sort of dramatic acting style synonymous with those times, I feel that Lon Chaney Jr. always managed to colour his version of Talbot in with, with equal shades of tragedy and empathy. Now, although House of Dracula is not that scary by any stretch of the imagination, there are two memorable scenes that I feel are definitely worthy of a relook. There is the hauntingly brilliant piano scene where Dracula slowly casts his predatory spell on a young and beautiful damsel as she sits and plays Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. It is the film's most genuinely captivating. But the other, which is my absolute and personal favourite because I happen to be a massive werewolf fan, is Larry Talbot's very first werewolf transformation as he stares out of the window of his holding cell at the full moon slowly floating out from behind those clouds. <laughs> Ooh. 
Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of the episode that House of Dracula was the very first horror movie that I ever saw. I must have been about 10 or 11 years old, and my dad had brought home with him this re-recorded VHS copy of an 80s action movie called The Last Dragon, which is quite a cool action movie, I must say. Now, for some reason, and I only discovered this about a year afterwards, after the end credits of The Last Dragon, House of Dracula popped up. Now, although the beginning of the film was missing, I still remember being absolutely mesmerized by those black and white images, the shadowy sets and the soft crackle in the background, and also the simplicity of the story. I was completely transfixed by the sound and the characters and House of Dracula, like many of those old vintage horror movies, bore a special kind of grainy charm and magic that I still can't explain to this day. Now all of that aside, the real reason why I feel that House of Dracula is indeed a forgotten horror movie gem and I feel should be appreciated as such is because, well to put it simply, House of Dracula is a keepsake that marks the end of horror's golden age. It is a final curtain call to those beloved monsters that captured our imaginations, that were present in our nightmares and still to this day inspire filmmakers all over the world. Earlier on I criticized the title, but you know what, I'm going to go back on what I said and I'm going to say it is the perfect title for this film. Why? Because it has a certain kind of iconic power. This is House of Dracula. Is that, a, is that okay? Was that respectful enough? Can I come back? So, there you have it fans of horror. Thank you so much for joining me on this first of many trips down horror's memory lane. And uh, let me know what you think of House of Dracula. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Drop me a comment down below. It's always great hearing from you. And if you like this kind of content, hook me up with one of those subscribe clicks and feel free to check out my Superior Sequels episode where I take a look at one of horror's newer but hopefully not to be forgotten classics, The Purge. On that happy note, all of you monsters, vampires, and werewolves out there, I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. Stay safe, stay happy, and most of all, stay horror. Ah, what music they